So welcome back to all participants and welcome to the new participants joining us for this session right now. It's a pleasure to have you with us. We hope you are well and enjoying the program so far. With us now is Andrew McLean, Professor of Art History at Tufts University and still with us is Clementine Delis, Associate Curator of KW Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin, our first responder. You still have the same possibilities to join our deep dive. If you have a question, you can still raise your hand and ask your question through the audio function of this webinar. I will call you by name and you can ask your question. If you prefer, you can also use the chat function of this webinar or you use our online form at campus.dream-publica.com. If you are following from a website or YouTube, you are welcome to use this tool as well. We will include those questions, of course. So let's begin. You can already start to send your questions. In the meanwhile, I will give the floor to Clementine for a quick reaction to the sprint. Thank you. Andrew, um, thank you very much for your incredibly interesting presentation. All the four have been, all four presentations are very stimulating. I noticed that like Kavita Singh, you teach art history, whereas the two other speakers are actually engaged in running either a venue, a Kunsthalle type venue or a museum. So it's quite an interesting contrast. And the last um, public question came from somebody who was interested in the question of how do we make museums popular without falling onto a kind of a nationalist grid or a nationalist matrix, I guess, of what a museum should be. And I think this question of the civic is very important. And I hope that we can come to that because right at the start of your talk, you speak about museums and social justice movements. Uh, this is really now the most burning issue that we have. How do we deal with the decolonial? And you quite rightly trace it back also to the formation of a, uh, I don't like high and low, it's a very 80s terminology, but you know what I mean, this high and low folk and uh, high art um, artists uh, or artists who are named, who come from Europe and Western countries or civilizations uh, and artists who don't need to have authorship or copyright or anything, but are, you know, part of our understanding of government international government, colonial government. And um, what is important is this contrast that you raise between the fine art museum and how it can contextualize, how it can present an argument through its exhibitions and the cultural history museum that feels that it needs to contextualize its exhibits. And so since the 80s, again, there's been this fairly numbing polarization between the pedestal power of the fine art museum with a spotlight on the artwork that we, we kind of know who it is. If not, then it's at least it's tribal art, if you see what I mean, if you're dealing with Africa. And on the other, or yeah, and on the other side you have the ethnographic exhibition. And out of this, even 30 years or 50 years later, we have to deal with an inherited propagated form of classification that's very, very difficult to break. And, uh, you know, the taxonomic management, you speak about taxonomic management and the ta taxonomic managers are effectively in great part custodians, the people who are the experts of the collections. Um, and I think we should remember, just a short aside, we shouldn't forget that collections are still being built from parts of the world that were subjected to colonial um, domination. These are usually archives or photography. So there isn't, it's not like it's finished and that, you know, now everything is over and we've got a better sense of what we should or should not be collecting. There's still a, a, a search for life's unknowns, for things that can be produced that will help us to understand why we live how as we do. Um, so you speak specifically about structural change. You reference the issue of the decolonial, of the non-represented peoples through their artifacts, and you say, and I quote, you can't tell diverse stories without aesthetically and socially diverse objects. So again, we come back to what Philip Tanari men mentioned earlier when he, I hope we're coming back to this idea that objects can cross borders. Nonetheless, they need to have, if you like, the representation of different voices, of several voices. 
And you um, make a very important statement, which I'd like you to respond to now. And th this is, I'll come to my question, but the, you say that the prioritization of museum space is the key metric of exclusion. Now, this is probably for me the most important statement this evening, because it will link perfectly to the question of entertainment, to the question of power, and to the question of architecture, which are all debates that are going to come up in the next panels. And what I want to understand from you is how radical could you imagine the reprioritization of museum space? Is effectively, are you actually saying in a weird kind of indirect way that the exhibition is a redundant form of knowledge transfer within a kind of sentient, aesthetic, and non-consumerist consumerist experience? And then I have to ask you, because you're an art historian, well, what about the source? What about the depots? What about the collections? What about the ideology of conservation? Kavita Singh said quite rightly that conservation is promoted by a rich boys club. And we need to regard the question of conservation as an ideological construct. It doesn't exist in the same way in different parts of the world. It's only in certain, certainly in, in European museums, you believe that an object has to be available for 1,000 years and therefore better to keep it in a safe place than to let a transdisciplinary group of researchers investigate it. So, is structural change really just a question of labels and taxonomic adjustment? Or can the museum become a civic space once again? And if it has to become a civic space, or which we would desire it to become a civic space, like a university or an art school, then what is the threshold? Is it social injustice? Is it the voice of the underrepresented? Or is it the actual ergonomy of studying, the ergonomy of engaging with artworks? This is my question to you. How can the museum become a civic space once again? No, thank you, Clementine. There's a lot in there to, to unpack. Um, and I, I'll struggle to answer and address everything that you said. I think we already assume that museums, uh, certainly in the US, it's the common assumption that museums are civic spaces. We call them public museums. They're located in the heart of cities and uh, we expect them to be open and available and meaningful to, to everybody. Uh, and it's a question of how we live up to that promise, that sense of mission that has always been there in our uh, museums. And that's really, I think, the struggle uh, to constantly adjust what museums do, what they are, who they represent in light of evolving uh, demographics, in effect, you know, our, our country is changing, it's changing very quickly. And uh, the complaint is that museums aren't keeping up with uh, that pace of change. And it's a difficult thing to do because uh, collections are built over a long period of time. Artworks are very expensive. Uh, in the United States, we rely on gifts for the most part. So it involves a sort of a patron class whose interests and whose uh, face isn't necessarily represented by the people who come to the museum. So it's a, it's a, it's a deeply entangled, difficult situation to think about structural change. Philip mentioned boards of governors, for example, and they're very important in this country. They really rule things from the top down. Well, who are these boards of governors? You know, how do they get there? What power do they, they, do they exact on systems? It's, uh, uh, these are all questions that aren't really self-evident, I think, to uh, the public and, and need to be, because they, therein lies the, the, the possibility, I think, for uh, making meaningful change. But I don't, we're not gonna get away from the, I think, the, uh, um, the baseline of art museums revolving around precious objects. That's the way they've been defined. I mean, we could scrap the whole thing and make art museums like history museums, in effect, which is kind of what's been going on in the last 40 years and making objects tell stories. But we are locked into a, 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 a sense of what those objects are by these sort of inherited taxonomies and hierarchies. I don't know if I answered any of your questions, but. 
I would like to include two questions that came in through uh, the chat and through our online tool. Um, Sheridan is asking whether you can speak a little more about the difference between negative representation of the absence of indigenous and the need to authentically incorporate indigenous art into the mainstream of a gallery. Well, I think this issue of diversifying collections and creating more inclusive um, uh, collection and space you know, is being addressed in the contemporary world uh, quite quickly. And it's, you know, it's easier to do to represent different voices and, and uh, different art forms, it seems, uh, in the contemporary world. My concern really is what happens in museums that are also historical in nature and how you go back into time and in effect create a more uh, inclusive, diverse history. And there you run up against the absence of objects simply that can speak to a variety of experiences. We are talking about museums that have for a very long time, if not if forever, uh, concerned themselves with uh, elite uh, art forms. And so uh, as long as that is true, museums struggle to represent more than elite perspectives and uh, elite patrons and elite artists uh, for that matter. And so this issue of relabeling elite objects to be inclusive in a sense, in the case of these uh, colonial portraits that talk about the sitter's relationship to transatlantic slavery, uh, you know, it, it, it complicates the canon. It's, it's an interesting thing to do, but it, it's, it, it doesn't get at representation in a more broader sense, except in a negative way because there simply is an absence of, of uh, uh, you know, we, we, we hear about a slave owner's enslaved uh, people, but we don't know anything about those people. There's no physical visual remnant uh, left to do that work. Maybe it's then also worth to include Natasha's question, who is asking about the people actually working as a, at the museum. So as she understands, we need diversity on all levels to change the future of museums. That means also on the level of staff director, uh, directors, etc. So how open are museums to change from the inside and what is a good way to do it? And um, maybe you can keep your answer a little briefer because we have one more question I would like to include as well. It, it, that too is a struggle. I think it's ongoing. And I think it, it has a lot to do with institutions recognizing their own limitations and their own implicit biases against broader uh, hiring practices. Uh, I think that's work that can change. And I think it is uh, in the course of changing. Uh, but it also is a question of what we call here the pipeline. You know, who are the students who are studying art history at universities? What limitations uh, do they face uh, going into the field in the first place? Art history in this country, at least, has long been an elite discipline. And that creates structural barriers to a broadening from the very base moving up into the uh, larger system. And our last question was also raised in the chat. Andrew, can you please clarify and respond on labeling matters in taxonomic museums? And is it enough to only label it for a museum? Uh, well, it, it, again, it's, if you're stuck with a collection, you have to, to deal with it. And it's a question of, you can, I think one can create all kinds of alternative interpretive structures that make objects tell different stories. and. Uh, in historical collections, that's really what, what, what there is to be done. I mean, a lot of museums now are trying very hard to expand categories so that they can tell a wider variety of stories. But to the extent that we are dealing with what we already have, what has been inherited, what has been given over centuries, then it's a question of, of uh, trying to squeeze out of those objects as many different stories and perspectives as, as one can. And, Labeling, docent tours, uh, interpretation, in short, is the, is the way to do that. I mean, so, if I could jump in here very briefly, it seems to me that one of the ways of breaking the, the barriers of taxonomy is to not look at a collection in isolation or a discipline in isolation any longer. So uh, what needs to be done is a much more heteroclite, uh, much more unexpected constellation of material that is selected by people who don't come from the inside of the museum, who are not the experts of the contextual taxonomy, 
but who are coming from the outside and want to see what happens when a particular object from a Cherokee background is placed next to, say, um, an, an object that would be in a period room, for example. This, that this kind of um, requirement to create um, a visual thinking has to feed into the way we, we process and de-taxonify or taxonomify uh, what we've done now. And my feeling is that it can only be done through an extreme form of dialogical investigation. In other words, no collection can really be seen in isolation because the collection itself comes from a prior interest, a different oh. taste. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I would like to thank you too very much. It was really interesting to listen to your thoughts and ideas. And Thank you so much for taking the time to answer the question as well. Thank you very much, Clementine, to take all the time for the whole day and uh, take, making all those statements. So a huge digital applause to the two of you. The Mars program actually continues and actually even starts the conversation with new perspectives on museums with the Future Forward panel, a great outlook, I think, to museums and futures by the upcoming museum makers and shapers, in this case, Alan Bieber, whose sprint you already heard, and Eva Karl, a young Croatia uh, fr that we invited for this conversation. So I hope you had fun with the program so far. Thank you for participating in this deep dive and have fun with our Future Forward panel. Thank you very much.